Bully and the Tiger. Bully groaned and stretched, forcing her eyes open. It was 4.30 in the morning, and already Dawn had crept into the room, spilling gently off her face onto the hard clay floor. The sun wakes up early in Assam, and everyone is up and about at this hour. Outside, the family had started on their chores. She could hear her mother and Aida, her grandmother, sweeping floors and fanning the kitchen fire. Ba 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 ba, Bully's elder sister, Shanti, was calling the chickens in the courtyard to come and get their breakfast. Then there was a squawking, fluttering protest from the hens as Babu, her little brother, ran shrieking past, for no other reason, it would seem, than to scare the birds. Bully knew she had better get up before someone came to fetch her. But she lay there a while longer, enjoying these last moments before the day came bustling in. Above her, three gaily painted cardboard butterflies flitted across the bamboo wall. Bully's house was made of bamboo, like all the houses in her village, Bagdoratila. It had bamboo beams and walls of strong woven bamboo matting. Even the doors and sliding windows were made of bamboo, as were the gate in front of the house, the fence around it, the tall bins in which the rice was stored, the tea strainer and the fish traps. Her father made baskets for a living. Bully got up and went to greet her father. He sat by the door with Coca, her grandfather. There were rows of baskets stacked behind them. They looked grave. Odd, they weren't working as they talked. She tried to catch her father's attention. But Peta wasn't really listening. You'd better go and help your eye, he said absently. Something was very wrong. But even her usually cheerful Aida seemed worried this morning. What could be the matter? Bully quietly ate her breakfast, last night's spicy lentil dolly, a weekly treat, and got ready for school, wondering what was troubling everyone. Babu knew better than to mess with his sister when she used that tone. They can't get any more bamboo because the contractor is asking for too much money. Thousands of rupees. PETA does not have the money to bid directly for forest bamboo from the government. I heard them talking, he blurted out as he danced jerkily ahead on the mud track. They walked on in silence. This was serious. In a while, they came to the outskirts of the town, where the brick factory stood. A line of people stood at the gate, waiting to be let in. Bully shivered. She had once carried bricks here with her parents, when the money had run short, and they had to work for wages to make ends meet. Now they might have to come back. No bamboo meant no baskets to make and sell. Her mind was racing as they got to school. Where could she get hold of bamboo for Peta's baskets? Her grandmother was spreading amla to dry on a mat by the jars of lemons and olives pickling in the sun. Aida, where's Peta? Bully tried to sound casual. Better not to arouse suspicion. Grown-ups had a way of stepping in and spoiling everything. Gone to Guwahati with Prabhurda to look for bamboo, replied Aida, swatting away her granddaughter's hand from the sour gooseberries. Too late. Bully had grabbed a handful and scampered off. She found her grandfather in the work shed. Good, he was alone, at least for now. Babu was off somewhere, 
probably tormenting Shanti or playing the two with his friends. In one quick move, Koka had halved a piece lengthwise. Shuck 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 with lightning speed the Dao split the bamboo. Then a bend and a turn, and the fine, even strips fanned out between his fingers. These were for Japis the wide-brimmed, upside-down ice cream cone hats that farmers wore while transplanting paddy. The rains were over this year, and the grain stood ripening in the fields. So these Japis would be lined with patches of colored felt or metallic paper, with trimmings of sequins, braid and baubles, to decorate the walls at festival time. Koka counted out five strips and crossed them over the tip of the mold he used to shape the crown. Bully had seen him do this a thousand times, but she still watched as he wove more strips around and across the frame. The cone done, his fingers moved swiftly around the base, adding strips and weaving them to form the shade, and then the turned down brim. Soon the outer layer of the joppy was done, a net of five pointed stars. He started on the inner layer. Bully picked up a pair of scissors to cut the shiny paper into neat triangles for the trimming. In the corner, she spied Peta's Dow. Excellent. Now all she had to do was smuggle it out of the house. Coca finished the inner lining of the joppy. He arranged the papers Bully handed him and sandwiched them between the two layers. Slightly whiter bamboo strips were placed across the underside of the shade for strength. Then a hoop around the base of the cone and another around the rim, secured with string to hold the layers in place, and it was ready. All that was left now was to glue on some sequins and a length of braid around the brim. And as they worked, Coca told his story. A long time ago, how long? Bully wanted to know. Don't interrupt, child, it was in my Coca's 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 Pita's time maybe even before that. There were only five houses by the river, with the hill behind and the jungle all around. The people grew rice and vegetables for themselves, and whatever little was extra they sold in the market. One year, the rains fell harder than usual. The sky was black as coal, even in the morning. The sun fell asleep, thinking it was night. The rain kept pouring down. The river rose higher and higher until the dam burst and the water flooded over into the fields towards our village. And still the downpour continued. The water was knee-high by now and still rising. The people were afraid. They huddled together, wet and hungry. If they didn't do something soon, their belongings would be washed away and they would drown. Then they heard it. Brewer, Abruer, so loud that the rain stopped and the sun peeped out from behind the clouds to see what was going on. Way up, on the top of the hill, stood a tiger handsome, huge, his coat glistening like pure gold. He was calling to them. Brewer, Abruer, come up he airier, but tigers can't speak our language, bully cut in. Have you ever met a tiger? She had to admit that she hadn't. Then how do you know they can't? He asked. There's plenty of bamboo here for you to use. It's strong and waterproof, good for building houses and supple enough to make baskets, which you can sell in the market. People always need baskets in which to carry and store. With one sweep of a front paw the tiger knocked down a stem and shredded it into strips with his claws. Then he showed them 
how to weave mats and baskets. And then he was gone. He disappeared into the thick jungle. But they knew he was watching them from behind the trees. The loka was already at the hanging bridge that stretched and swayed across the stream separating the jungle from their village. Did you get it? She asked. It's here, Bully patted the basket at her waist. Let's get the fish first, she added. The hillside was dotted with shallow ponds, teeming with silvery fish that fed on the water plants. Bully and Aloka dipped their bamboo bottle-shaped fish catchers into one, then lifted them out. They picked out the weeds and threw the fish into their baskets. Soon their baskets were full. The girls headed back towards the hanging bridge. The plan was to go into the jungle and bring back some bamboo for their parents. Finding the bamboo would be no problem. It grew in thick clumps all over the forest. Bully and Aloka were sure they could carry the bamboo back to the village. They would balanced five bricks each on their heads during their time at the factory. How they would get it into their houses without being found out was entirely another matter. Their luck had held so far. They could only pray that their parents would be so happy to see the bamboo that they wouldn't think to ask how it got there. Pleased with their clever plan, the two friends crossed into the forest. Oh no! They weren't alone. Babu and Cajun were kicking a dented plastic ball around the clearing. Bully and Aloka slipped quietly past them, behind the trees, only to run into Sanjita, with her small brother up pal in tow, collecting firewood. Where are you going? Sanjita asked. To get some bamboo. We're coming too. The sister and brother joined the team. Dusk was falling. The birds were calling to each other from their roosts. The frogs croaked and splashed in the ponds, and the crickets had already started their chirruping. Soon the night would swoop down on them. They girls knew they had better get home soon. It took them a while to realize they were lost. One wrong turn somewhere had taken them deeper into the jungle than they had ever been before. Bully and Aloka clung to each other trembling wondering which way to go. Then they heard it. A slow majestic swish. Everything else had gone silent. They strained to get a better look in the half-light. This was no bamboo stem. Could it be? A flash of a gold and brown striped tail? Bully remembered Coca's story. They must follow the sound. Trustingly, they went with the crackle, pop, swish through the thick foliage, onto the track leading to the hanging bridge. They couldn't see much, just the hint of a whisker, the twitch of an ear, and, once, a glint of kind amber eyes that seemed to say, no need to worry. I will show you the way. The girls turned to thank their friend, but there was no one there. Just the jungle noise behind them, and the village lights up ahead. Bully said goodnight to Aloka, and ran off. They would talk about what they had seen tomorrow. She had to get home, and put the Tao in its usual place before it was missed. She had just replaced the Tao and was handing the fish to Ai with some excuse about being so late when they heard the gate open. Peter was back from Guwahati. He was smiling. The family crowded round him, eager to hear the news. We found a dealer in the city willing to sell us bamboo at the old price if we bought a large enough quantity, he said happily. 
so we ordered enough for all the basket weavers. They'll be sending a truck tomorrow. Bully was bursting to tell her own story. So, amid all the excitement, without being asked, she announced to no one in particular, Aloka and I met a tiger in the jungle today. Everybody laughed. Don't be silly, said Shanti in her best older sister tone. There aren't any tigers here anymore. Bully looked at her grandpa. He didn't say anything. But behind the spectacles she saw the wink and smiled. Coca knew. About the illustrations the art of the Partangan tribals of the Dindori Valley in Mandla, Madhya Pradesh, uses tonal and contrasting color blocks built up from dotted sections. The artists paint trees, shrubs, birds, and animals in a powerful and lyrical way. Gond art is usually executed on the outside walls of the mud huts of the people, 